issue. Time to talk to the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. To take us there, here was the Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Miles, on why we are seeing an energy price crisis right now. What we've got now is really the product of uh, nine years of failure on the part of the former government in terms of having consistent energy policy. And it's why uh, we, we don't have renewables online in the way that we should. Re investment in renewables has been down. It's why we don't have a grid which can accept them. And that's what we're going to do. But given the failure of the last nine years, that's now why we have an energy crisis in the country right now. David Littleproud, welcome to the program and congratulations on your elevation to the leadership. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So after nine years in government, do you accept any blame for the energy price uh, crisis now facing manufacturers and households? No, because the one lever that Chris Bowen hasn't been able to pull is that to pick up the phone and talk to the gas companies. That's the action that we've been able to do in the past because we had a relationship with them. We haven't demonised them, we haven't put them down. And when I hear Chris Bowen talking about he's going to talk with his state colleagues, why hasn't he reached out to the gas companies, the ones that actually drill and bring this gas up and put supply into the system? This is uh, the short-term solution to make sure that we can get more su uh, domestic supply, but it's also about the infrastructure structure we need to put in place. And we put in place a, a model where we were going to invest in gas infrastructure that the new government says they won't undertake. Now, even if they want to move uh, in a more expedited way to renewables, uh, they can only do that with the help of gas because when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, and which has also gone in, particularly since we're in a La Nina effect from solar not being as prevalent, what we aren't able to do is switch coal on quickly, but what you can switch on quickly is gas. Uh, and that is the flexibility of gas. Now, we've got a sensible policy, had a sensible policy in not only protecting gas, protecting our, our, our coal industry as well with carbon capture storage. We had a, 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 a sensible plan for the long term. But the short term is about picking the phone up and having a relationship with those gas companies, those suppliers, okay. not well, state governments. State governments have got more Just let me, let me jump gas. in there. So why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you talk to those that are bringing them in? OK, to be clear, Madeleine King, the Resources Minister, has been doing exactly that. I don't think she or the gas companies have made any secret of the fact they've been talking and finding extra supply where they can. But let me ask you, during your nine years in government... Well, well hold on, I think the, the gas companies are high up in... But, David, the gas companies are high up in the stirrups because they can see the price where they are. They've had a labour opportunity Position that were demonising them for nine years, saying that they were part of, of the problem in our emissions, uh, and now they want to turn around and befriend them when they need them. I mean, uh, let's understand your place in the world. The Labor government okay. has well, now have to go cap in hand, and they're going to have to, but at least reach out to them. Chris Bowen Well, should my point do is that. they have. They've had, they've had conversations. That's the disappointing but thing. But let me ask you, in, in your nine years in government, the Nationals did talk a lot about funding coal-fired power. That didn't happen. You introduced a gas trigger and you never used it. Uh, you did have some you know, catchy slogans, technology, not taxes. Um, but, but here we are. Are you, are you seriously saying you have no regrets about what you did in the energy market over nine years? Well, David, you can look about 60 kilometres west of where I'm sitting now and carbon capture storage is being implemented on a coal-fired power station uh, from Milmerin. Uh, that's the investment that we made in giving investment certainty and making sure that we had reliable energy, complementing that with renewables and also gas. We had a gas-led recovery that was going to invest in the infrastructure to increase the supply because where I sit at the moment in the Surat Basin... Is this a gas-led recovery? That was imposed... On well, part of, it, part of what we were saying, David, was that we were going to invest in gas infrastructure to increase our domestic supply. Uh, and that was a significant investment in infrastructure that we put in place to make sure that we had reliable, affordable energy. That was a sensible solution about making sure that you could have all of the above in your energy mm -hmm. mix. That was the sensible solution that we took and started to implement. Angus Taylor started to implement. We worked with the states. Now, there's some states that have moratoriums on gas. My home state state here in Queensland don't. And I'll give credit where credit's due. The Queensland government about four or five years ago opened up more tenements uh, just for domestic supply. We've also been able to work constructively with the Northern Territory government around the Beetaloo Basin. Uh, and this was about bringing states with us. They own the resource, but we also need to work with the resource companies. And this is the problem mm. you have. If you tear down those relationships after years, then invariably it comes back to bite you, particularly well, when you need short-term yeah. solutions. We could pick the phone up and help them get this sorted. Well, a lot of that gas in Queensland of course, is, is being exported. Can I just be clear on this? Do you think the government should be using the so-called trigger right now 
to keep more gas in Australia, even though it wouldn't happen until next year? Well, this is where you don't need to, David. If you have a relationship with a gas company, you pick the phone up. I think you have to respect the well, they solidity say they don't have any of extra those gas. contracts. They say they don't have any extra gas than what's currently being Well, I think, I think that they, they do, David. So they're, they're it, wrong, are they? It's the fact that they're right... Well, they're riding high up in the stirrups when prices are high. Uh, they do have the capacity uh, to increase supply, and that's where you need to have a relationship with them and be okay. able to work with them constructively rather than So you, you think when the gas companies them. say they have no additional gas, that you know, they're pumping as much as can be pumped south, uh, the rest is contracted, you, you reckon they're wrong? They, they have some up their sleeve somewhere? Well, with support of sensible policy with the government, and you can you can actually increase that supply. And I've had detailed conversations with Angus Taylor, who, who gives me that assurance that there is ways in which we can increase that supply. We can increase that supply now. And but where, where, do, where do you put it though? Because that North South pipeline was running at ninety eight percent capacity during the week. Well, well, this is this is where uh, there are opportunities to increase the supply through some of, improving some of those constraints. You can do that in the short term? quickly. Those are the how do you well, do that? Well, in the short term, David. That, well, David, that's about making sure you send strong signals to the market of what we're going to do, not not walking in with the big arm of government and telling them that we're going to take away your your sovereign rights. Okay, of being but the, able the, the to pipeline's have running at which, capacity. In which this government, which is in which the Labor government, in fact, when they when they created the Strat Basin here, in mm. fact, didn't look to any domestic supply. The, the Rudd government and the Bly Labor government here in Queensland came in and simply said it was all for export. They didn't think ahead about that domestic okay. supply. So should they? So pull the trigger or not? Should they, should they pull the trigger or not? Well, I, I don't think it's going to have any impact if it can't come into effect until the 1st of July. So when Peter Dutton says Parliament the government should pull levers... So the 1st of January, I should say. You, 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 you don't think they should pull the trigger? Well, we're not coming back to, to Parliament until the end of July for a government that was uh, into us when they were in opposition about never sitting, when we were seven or eight weeks away from sitting again. Should they pull the trigger that, or that, not? That, that trigger, well, David, I'll answer the question. That trigger will not come into effect until the 1st of January. Uh, that's a long way off. That's a long winter for many people mm. in eastern Australia so no point. who will shiver because, because they have not had the relationship with the gas companies to step up and to pick the phone up. This is the trigger you guys legislated and, and all Chris Bowen all Chris Bowen is talking to all Chris Bowen is talking to are state and territory governments that's not going to fix the problem well they're talking to you gas companies to we, we've covered that with just on the trigger the just on the trigger just on the trigger that you legislated you're saying it's pretty useless well, well if it if it can't come into effect until the 1st of January. Um, there's a lot of cold days between now and then, David, wouldn't you think? I mean, this is about a short-term solution that needs to be fixed now, and that's about leadership. That's mm -hmm. about creating the relationship, not just talking to state and territory governments. This is about a big government talking to other big governments. This is actually about working constructively with industry, the ones that can actually pump it up for us and put it out into the system. So that's what we're saying is mm -hmm. pick the phone up, be constructive with these companies. You will find practical solutions through this. Longer term, do you think we should have a gas reservation policy to keep more Australian gas in Australia, like the one that operates in WA? Well, I think that's a conversation we should start to explore and what understand, do you think? particularly uh, with... Well, David, I think that's in the cold, hard light of day of working through the energy policy that the government's going to bring forward, particularly if they want to accelerate renewables ahead of uh, making sure that we, we can actually retrofit coal-fired power stations using... Well, I'll answer the question. This is it'll be it'll be predicated on what, on what the policy and the, and the way in which this government wants to bring forward renewables. Because if you bring renewables forward, and you need to you need to actually fix up the intermittency of it, then coal coal uh, is a lot harder to do than gas. Gas can be fired up quickly at a, mm -hmm. basically at the switch of a button, whereas coal takes longer. But I think this is where our policy was sensible about investing in coal-fired power stations in reducing emissions. Getting back. Okay, just coming back though. to the question, we just sorry, the we question was a gas reservation. But we should be about, we should be yeah. about, David, we should be about first principles of reducing emissions. Okay. And if just coal the fired question, power though. stations can do that, then we should invest in that. If gas can do that, we should do that. And renewables will obviously play a significant role in that okay. as well. Just for viewers, though, the question was a gas reservation policy, good idea or not? Well, again, I think that there is merit to it, but one that needs to be explored with detail. We're okay. not the government and we don't hold the levers at the moment, but one in which I would work constructively with, yes. OK. Uh, let's turn to climate change. What do you think the message from the Australian people at this election was on climate change? 
well, they want a clear pathway uh, to us to continue to reduce emissions. We had uh, a commitment, an international commitment that we made, uh, not only in terms of net zero by 2050, but one we made and achieved in Kyoto, one that we will, we will make and beat with respect to Paris. And we did that through using this thing called common sense, protecting traditional industries. And, and as I say, again, yeah. getting back to that core principle of, of reducing emissions. How we do it should be about using the technology and leveraging uh, private capital to make sure that we achieve that rather than the good old Australian taxpayer having to kick the tin all the time. And that's what we bought in terms of our net zero policy, one in which met our international commitments, gave us a licence to, uh, to trade. And you've got to understand, had we not signed up to that, the National Party, Barnaby Joyce led when we signed up to that, uh, was a sensible one because what it did was give us a licence that meant that we weren't going to see our commodity prices fall for our farmers. But was the and message from the electorate, do you think... You would factor in up in, to three percent, three percent into your mortgage, and no Australian could afford an extra three okay. percent on your mortgage. All right. So, so we but, went to a technology, and uh, not not using the big hand of government. And was this, do you think, what the people endorsed at the election? Is, is my question. Well, I think there's a number of things that the electorate endorsed, and, and, and you've got to understand that we're a big country and diverse country mm -hmm. in some parts of this country. It was a very strong message, and all we say is we respect that ideology. But what you've got to understand and just say to those people, particularly in those more affluent areas of, of this country, is please just take the time, take a step back, and reflect and understand the impacts it has on Australians not as fortunate or as financially endowed as you to actually understand the impact you're having on their jobs mm -hmm. and potentially taking away their livelihoods, but actually try and work in a collaborative way and reducing those emissions in a sensible way. Just stick to those first principles of reducing okay. emissions. And if you can do that with a coal-fired power station, with carbon capture storage, why wouldn't you? You talk about uh, the... Sen you mentioned the word sensible there. You've talked about uh, putting the party, the Nationals, in the sensible centre. Just quickly on a few things. What does the sensible centre mean on an integrity commission? Are you open to a more robust model than, than the, the previous government had? Yeah. So, David, uh, the Sensible Centre is drawing on the principles of, of common sense from the centre right of politics with the National Party brings. And so we've always been supportive of an integrity commission. It was just the mechanism. And the, and the real difference in mechanism is, is to make sure it didn't become a political weapon for anyone to use, but to, to have the powers of a Royal Commission, which this one that we were proposing would have had. But it just it was the only difference was the juncture in which those hearings became public. Now, if someone had done wrong and the Commission found that they'd done wrong, then obviously charges would be laid. And that, that quite rightly, is the juncture in which uh, someone's reputation should be tested in a court of law. But rather than actually have a mechanism where it could be used as a political weapon, and I think everyone, everyone is, is comfortable with it. It was just that we didn't want to see that people's reputations were destroyed for political gain. And it actually took away those great Australians that wanted to put their hand up because they feared being demonised, rightly or wrongly ever. And, and that was the thing is we want, to, we want to create an environment that shows that transparency. And that really was the only real point of difference is the juncture in which it became public that wow. um, you, you'd and been uh, charged with doing uh, something of, of criminal action. And that yeah. should be the case in which you are outed. OK, and the Sensible Centre, where, where does that leave you on an Indigenous voice to Parliament? Well, I think most Australians wouldn't know what the technicalities of a, of a voice to Parliament looks like, but what, in our mind, it looks like is actually shifting the dial and closing the gap. That connection from the grassroots of Indigenous Australians, whether they be in Central Australia, whether they be in Kunnamulla or, or Dubbo, uh, that they have a, a voice, a connection back to the, to the Parliament to, so that the solutions that we put forward are practical, are tactile, that yeah. actually shift the dial on domestic violence, that shift the dial on education. Education, because ultimately I, I get the symbol, symbolism of it, and that's important. But also, what's important is that we do shift that dial in closing the gap, and that's what that's what centre right, sensible centre from right. the National Party. Looks what about like. enshrining it in the constitution? Is, of, is enshrining it in the constitution something you're close to, or you're willing to consider? Well, again, until until the, the government brings forward what that looks like, then it's difficult to sit, stand here mm -hmm. and to make commentary. And I think this is the important thing, okay. David. But the, the former the, government was the, opposed the government to any, any change in the constitution to put a voice to parliament in the constitution. You're not ruling that out at the moment? 
Well, well we haven't seen any detail. Uh, and I think what, what mm. needs to be demonstrated here, the opportunity for the government to demonstrate to all sides of the political spectrum, is what does it look like in shifting the dial? And I, I think Jacinda Price is spot on on this because she lives and breathes this every day. She's the one that's there with these communities and understands what it means to live in these communities and, and the hurt and heartache that is in those communities and what they want. What they want is practical measures, and that's what the voice should provide. And that's what, it, as, as I understand it, it should provide, will provide. But the Labor Party and the government now need to provide that to us of what is a detail, but they should engage with people like Jacinta Price, who actually have lived experience in it. Final one. Uh, today we'll see the Shadow Ministry announced. You've presumably finalised your coalition agreement with uh, Peter Dutton. I'll invite you to tell us what's in that usually secret uh, agreement, if you'd like. But um, uh, how many front bench positions have you secured for the Nationals? Well, David, I will be announcing that in the next couple of hours. I'll be in a car on the way to Brisbane. But let me say, with respect to coalition agreements, it's all about policies. And you see those policies that we enact. And you don't ask to get underneath the closed doors of the left or the right of the Labor Party. I don't think you should expect to be in the policy discussions that the Liberal Party and the National Party has. I don't see right. why it's what just the, the front coalition bench, agreement though? that you seem to want to have the details of. You'll see, you'll see a front bench that draws on the experience of those that have come before us, but also some new faces that will take the National Party to the 2025 election with some enthusiasm uh, and energy uh, and new policies. And we'll work with Peter Dutton and his Liberal Party to make sure that we have a cogent argument to take oh. to uh, the next election in did, 2025. Um, did Barnaby Joyce make the front bench? Uh, you'll have to wait and see. No oh. scoop for you today, David. OK. Nationals leader David Littleproud, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, mate.